future is here. What has Drupal got to do with it? I'm Allison. I work uh, for Garden Workroom Cooperatives. Boston, Nicaragua, possibly Minneapolis soon. So, you promised a glorious future. You knew it was coming. You had visions. You had all kinds of concepts of what it would be. Somehow we ended up here instead. This is a, a self-driving capable car that I've heard was tested out with uh, the knowledge that someone would be trying to hack it. And they successfully hacked it. <laughs> and drove into a ditch. Um, you can think of all kinds of other things also. Um, so it's hard to convince people that it matters what runs on their devices and they're in their bodies and in their automobiles um, and everything else in the services we use on the cloud. Uh, Richard Stallman has been working on that for decades. Cory Doctorow is a million times more eloquent than I am and has great examples like prosthetic legs that will walk you back to um, you know, the, the repossession a uh, lot if uh, you miss a payment. And there's already uh, uh, cars that, uh, you, you know, they lease at extortionate rates and if you miss a payment, they disable it, possibly stranding, you know, it's, it, it has stranded people in dangerous situations. Uh, and this is all about, you know, what level of control we have over our technology. But that's very hard to communicate and, you know, Watch one of Cory Doctorow's um, you know, talks on this. I have uh, you know, 50 minutes and a lot of other things I want to cover, so I'm going to show you a scary picture. A uh, trigger warning airplane crash. Oh, there goes that. Yeah, I protected us all from that. Um, all right, yeah, but yeah, Cory Doctorow is saying computers and the internet increasingly uh, everywhere, and the uh, world is made of them, um, and you know, why that is scary pictures. Uh, and this, you know, and there's an Airbus that, you know, just the software malfunction is like, never made a website that had a bug, but, well, the software and everything else can have, have bugs also. And actually it's doing pretty remarkably well, and it's not to say that, um, yeah, it's not to say that things, um, you know, are doing pretty well, but it's like you figure, okay, this stuff is really important, you know, control over automobiles, you know, control over things running. Pacemakers and stuff is really important, and you know, surely the people working on it will will figure all that stuff out. This is the brain virus. Uh, this is the first uh, computer virus. Um, we just passed the 30th anniversary of it. Um, I'm sure there must have been earlier predecessors, but this was written by a couple young kids, brothers in Lahore, Pakistan, who are still doing business as brain computer services. Um, one version of the story, they were just, you know, they were used to Unix and, you know, that was what they built on and everyone was going Microsoft and they're like, this is insane, like, this is so insecure and they just, you know, wrote a virus to show how insecure it was. Um, the other story is that they were attempting to track copyright theft and, you know, one person had multiple motivations and there were two of them, so both stories might be true. Um, they certainly didn't have malicious intent, they put their address right <laughs> in what they wrote in this group section. Uh, <laughs> and they're still there. <laughs> um, but um, the, the point is that, you know, horribly insecure things can in fact become global standards. You know, despite this, Windows went on to run most people's personal computers. And, you know, the economic cost of computer viruses is estimated at hundred billion dollars a year annually. It's not like, no one has any reason to care, it's only affecting some people. It's affecting major businesses and they still haven't gotten it right. Um, so I think the political and economic consequences for people as a whole are of not having control over software is a bigger deal. Um, but it, you know, it really can be a matter of life and death and you can't just count on, you know, people who are currently in the decision making uh, positions to actually, you know, put enough emphasis on making this great. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, software is in general making things safer and will probably continue to make things safer. Uh, this is going off a little bit, but I love this. You know, it's 
picturing, you know, someone asking in the future, what did you do before self-driving cars? Drove ourselves! And, you know, millions of deaths, the high deaths and roadway accidents and pedestrians getting killed that we currently have. Uh, technology probably will make us safer, but the um, specter of self-driving cars um, brings up another important aspect of control over technology, and that's um, how monopolies or oligopolies of uh, you know, control over communication, control over technology are used to increase um, you know, economic power of a small group and, um, and the effects that have on others. So I mean, if we, if we have self-driving trucks and cars, you know, that's you know, four million of the better paying jobs you know, in the country just gone. You know, you know, basic income and kind of you know, plans for that, but it's, it's, not, it's not technology that's necessarily being driven by overall needs. It, it may be, but it's, in, it's going to be implemented by a, people. a few people who have control and they have their interest, and it's not going to be done in the broader interest. Or if it, you know, at the very least, if ownership were more distributed, the, the benefits would come through, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, but on the, just the general purpose of concentration of power, leading concentration of wealth, also being a matter of life and death, um, the, the just life expectancy um, disparity by income, not even wealth, much greater, is, is large and increasing. This is Washington Post um, chart of just two counties that are right next to each other in Florida, um, but have you know, significant income disparity. And there's you know, getting close to a decade of disparity uh, in men's lifespan. Again, this is just two counties. This isn't even just taking the richest of the poorest. This is just two counties that have an average wealth difference. So, as a web developer, I've always been very grateful um, sorry, um, that my mistakes would be hard pressed to kill anyone. Viruses and bugs that cause crashes of just software, um, or just software, or you know, crashes that also cause the hardware, um, and getting hacked. These are all things where actually are, you know, the general public's interest and the interests of, you know, the corporations and governments controlling the technology are actually in complete alignment. Like, nobody wants things to crash. No one wants things to get hacked. Um, but when, and it's even more worrying when you look at control of technology and communication and where interests may not um, go in alignment. Um, this is Corner Gaines, who was uh, shot a couple of days ago, killed uh, by police. Um, she was you know, resisting arrest or resisting being served and warned from her home. But she'd been obsessed with the possibility of the police shooting her ever since the traffic stop. And is you know, giving a video here that she was streaming to Facebook Live, telling her five-year-old son to um, to film all encounters with the police. And the police, like 12 hours into a standoff, they're trying to serve her a warrant related to that traffic stop. And she's got a gun, shotgun, gun. She's saying, nope, don't come to my house, mail it. Um, like, you can mail the warrant, you don't need to serve it to me in person. Um, 12 hours into that, they tell Facebook to cut the live stream account, disable, disable access. And shortly after that, they shot her. Um, that's like a really stark, really, four days ago, or less, um, example of concentrated control of technology and communication being used in a very scary way um, by, you know, the corporation just saying, like, sure, to the authorities who apparently really felt it was more important to serve this warrant than to, you know, not kill anyone that day. Um, her five-year-old son was wounded, but is not life-threatening. Um, so, I, that's like, you know, way too heavy-handed background on, like, why I think it's, uh, like, what's controlling our technology and what isn't um, is really, really important. And then we get to, you know, the software we work with like Drupal, open source, free software, and it quite frankly has a funding problem. Uh, so 
you know, using a tool we use at a Drupal Boston meetup this Tuesday, I asked everyone what they were using for their integrated development environment. And it was 90% proprietary across the board. Um, you know, we are most of everyone in that room and a lot of us here are making our living working directly with open source and software. But, you know, we're using a proprietary tool. And why? Because it's, you know, it works better for what we need it to do. <laughs> um, so even though we're like more likely to be a little bit in on the theory of control of our own technology, a little bit more um, attuned to, you know, just the benefits of, of, of free software and like the theory that, okay, maybe we could make a change in the ID ourselves or hire someone to do it. It's like, nope. The thing that works off the shelf is is what we're going to use, and and we're programmers. <laughs> so, um, where does that leave uh, everyone else? Um, so, what I'd like to talk about mostly is why you know what when free software, open source free software, works as far as the funding model goes, and and where it doesn't. So, programmers working on our own tools is you know where it works and that's when our tools are like the ones we're working with um all the time so you know we you know every uh programming people who work in every programming language have sort of rebuilt the concept of package management um in every one and you know some great tools have come out of that and you know node has uh, uh yeah javascript has dozens uh <laughs> but uh, package management systems essentially now in, in uh, Drupal and PHP, we're using Composer. Um, but all of this is being done as free software. Um, library after library is amazing. Um, you know, JavaScript libraries, um, and in some cases, Drupal modules themselves. And these are all, you know, when you know we get to work on something that's directly going to. Um, Benefit us. So, sort of like immediate development tools written in the same, um, you know, the same level of the stack that we're already doing our work in. So, you know, we're much less likely to make a commit to improve PHP itself or to, you know, work on the, you know, Linux kernel or any of the GNU systems supporting our servers and all that. But, um, you know, currently, uh, you know, developers being paid pretty well just to work on, uh, you know, client sites or at larger companies. We're allowed to work on our own tools, and some pretty cool stuff comes to that. And sometimes it's you know complete obvious. You know, you're not being paid by anyone. You're for that work. You're being paid for something else. Also, great works um, are, are coming out of it. And then on the other side is like where. Uh, Open source free software is also taking over uh, in levels of the enterprise, like whole stacks of the of the technology layer for running modern web applications, server internal work is uh, is you know full stack open source kernel, open source operating system, GNU Linux, and open source. Uh, you know, library after service after service. Um, and, you know, that, uh, you know, at, at this enterprise level, Red Hat, which is, you know, does very well, employs many people directly working on making this software more stable, more scalable, you know, can partner with, uh, uh, you know, mostly proprietary uh, providers just fine. If they're, you're, it's, and, they're providing layers on of that service, and you know the large companies. Their competitive edge isn't coming from you know the the layer that Red Hat's providing. They just need it to be the most maintainable and scalable they can get, and um, and that's where open source free software is is dominating. Where you know there's a large number of large things that have the same need. They can afford to pay uh, to have it supported. And whether they employ, you know, kernel developer or someone directly themselves, um, or you know, contract a company like Red Hat, there's a fair number of people 
pay to you know, directly work on the software. Uh, and so I'd like to take that a little bit more back into our neck of the woods. Um, and uh, yeah, but Sony Music, uh, well, okay, first of all, as everyone knows, the uh, Tuple module views. Oh, all right. Is there any real connection to the slide here, Sony Music? All right. So, <laughs> so Earl Miles, the original creator of views, which now is a blade four. Um, and he uh, was employed full time by Sony Music when Sony Music, and they still do, but is, su is supporting a whole bunch of artist sites. They're putting all of their musicians on one platform. And, you know, this is a, a perfect, you know, example of, uh, you know, a need many people have, funding it, and, you know, they gave Earl Miles the freedom to do it the way that he released it as free software, um, as you know, what became a very fundamental part of the Drupal ecosystem. Uh, and that was made possible by full time employment for just supporting um, a, a platform, but you know, it's entirely inside one company. Um, so, what I'm sort of uh, going to be getting proposing later is to sort of you know, imagine a parallel history where the independent artists who weren't on Sony could have done the same thing. You know, there's, you know, Sony did provide the aggregation of the, the need in this case, but the same need to have sites that list your upcoming tour dates, lists all kinds of things, um, and have a flexible list building system. Uh, would apply to independent artists also, or you know, that could have uh, confederated in various ways. Uh, but you know, when people, you know, I think it's mostly been dropped, but like going years back in the Drupal community, if you sort of brought up, well, how do we fund this? People would be like, that's impure. Like, you know, we just work on it. And it's like, no, there's actually people who do get paid for it full time, and we get some amazing things out of it. We need for miles and to bring up the story of how he was able to work on views for full time for you know over a year, um, or you know, almost full time on views, and he had other things there, but also, um, and you know, the CCK, which became Fields, um, written by Karen Stevenson, she did do that like completely on her own time, you know, supporting a couple clients, but like you know, she, that was just pure like putting in much more effort than you know you can expect to get back, which is the other way we get a lot of stuff done in open source free software. And that's that's also good, but it clearly hasn't proven to be enough because you know it's not funding um, the open source IDs at the same level as our proprietary ones. It's not funding most of us our operating systems. It's you know we're using proprietary tools because they're better and we know free software is a superior development model. You get to look at everyone else's code, and anyone can make a contribution, spot bugs, and you know internally the the you know big software companies of our time. Well, first of all, they're using lots of free software inside what gets packaged up as proprietary tools. But they also, like Google, um, allows any engineer anywhere to commit to any project that they're doing. So they have sort of like this, you know, they have thousands, thousands of engineers, so they can sort of recreate the open source ecosystem inside of their their um, their proprietary world. Even for the, the, you know, they've got plenty of um, open source projects, but they also tons of things that like you know the Gmail interface and stuff like that that are not shared. But any engineer, even if they're working on something totally different, if they get an itch, something bugs them, they can. Um, Submit um, uh, a fix to the team that actually is working on it, and it's often accepted. That's exactly the way free software works. But um, you know, Google is raking in you know billions of dollars, and we don't have that same level, at least in as coordinated uh, a way, for the the source of the baseline funding for doing the work. 
So, Drew's by by type, um, founder of Drupal, um, like does some really, really keen thinking on this stuff. Um, checking out his blog posts and looking at his ideas of where the future of the open web is going, definitely worthwhile. Um, but he says, you know, wall gardens are winning um, because they have a superior user experience, you know, flat out. Um, and so he's talking about um, websites, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, open web. But I think the same point extends to all proprietary software. But in our world of building websites, it's a lot more relevant, um, you know, the, the, the websites we're competing with. So that, that superior um, user experience, the point I'm arguing is that it's paid for by piles of cash, much more than the average free software project gets. Um, and it's disciplined by paying customers in most cases. Sometimes it's customers who are paid for by ads, but it's still sort of a one-to-one, -one, there's a person using the software and there is money coming from that person that can be used to support the development. Um, and that's what uh, you know, most proprietary software has that most free software does not. Um, so I'm saying that free software needs a new business model. And you know, where could we find one that's you know, just a, a step away? And uh, of course, when you look at Facebook and Google and Twitter and all of that, their engineers are using free software, contributing um, significantly to free software. And then you look at every startup you can think of, and they're building directly on free software. And so SaaS is software as a service. So pretty much anything you can think about paying for online is already, you know, using lots of components of, of free software, but um, they're packing, packaging it up in a proprietary thing that's that's not shared. And that's, yeah, and, you know, but still sharing that, the, the underlying layer. So it's, it's really just the, it really is just that last mile of user experience polishing that isn't, you know, doesn't get, uh, fun, you know, doesn't get put back into free software. But I mean, that's not something that you really can. Like, each user experience has to be very specific to the, the purpose that it's being served. That's much harder to package up into libraries and share. So we're already sharing, like, a huge number of the pieces needed to put together a great user experience. But doing that last piece of putting that user experience together on a platform that isn't, um, you know, sort of controlled just by like, one venture-backed company or one, you know, uh, self-funded company uh, is, or one, you know, publicly traded company, you know, where that concentration of the technological and communication bottleneck, um, we are not yet doing. Uh, but, um, you know, free software does have some advantages if you, um, if you look at it as a service. So first of all, if you're doing free software as a service, you sort of solve this, this business model problem of if you have free software um, you know, as, a, as, a, as a shippable product that people download, or free software as something that you know, people just go and get themselves, you've got no dollar revenue coming in per person. If you're doing it as a service, it's bundled with the hosting. And just like with you know any software as a service, the person paying isn't like, oh, how much money is going to for the development? How much money is paying for the servers? How much money is going to the CEO's pocket? How much money is going to the investors? Like they don't care. They're just saying I'm paying you know twenty dollars a month for the service that makes my life better. So there's not really any reason that free software can't compete there, and where it has advantages. Um, as far as the question, as far as the argument, is uh, freedom to take data and functionality upstream. Um, and uh, the freedom to take the platform in any direction once you can form the whole platform, which you can't do with um, many other things. Um, 
And so, you know, these are both, like, these are arguments that can make it more attractive to certain types of users. Now, it's also going to put something of a limit on your, you know, upside return on investment if you're trying to build a platform, you know, that's based on free software all the way to the top of the stack. And it also offers security for development partners, which is you know, going to increasingly be a critical jobs in agencies. Um, the, the idea that there's more and more value going into the, the closed ecosystems, the, the platforms that exist on the web, like you know, using Facebook as your site login because most everyone's already there. Um, that kind of thing is going to increase where you know someone's gonna have tied up most of the data and, and, and most importantly, users' network effects, and we're going to have to um, interact with them. Um, and that puts us in a sort of precarious position. Uh, if any of us follow the side of Twitter, or Apple, or any of these companies, there's sort of a large tendency to be like, you know, people plug into their APIs and create great functionality on it, and at some point that company is like, yeah, I'm just going to take that functionality and incorporate it into the main platform. And, you know, it's great for the user, but basically someone else just did all of the research and development, and it was grabbed by Twitter and, you know, bringing in, like, everything, pretty much, that's <laughs> been, been added to that platform as far as uh, the, the way, uh, um, like, desktop clients and, and apps interact with it. Um, you know, Google is on the way to incorporating the pick a schedule an event, which is also you know pioneered by outside services. And yeah, once it's built into the platform, everyone's just going to use that. Um, but when you look at you know um, what we're doing and what what our clients may be doing, like publishing, you know, they're in a situation where Facebook is you know increasingly feeding onto that. So. You know, if you if you can do some you know major platform whether it's news publishing or you know just social media um, all kinds of things as a service as a free software as a service it gives the development partners the content partners uh, a bit more security that there's a limit to how greedy the person who controls the, the platform can get and you know as that becomes more an issue may actually be enough of a competitor. So I, I liken the uh, a lot of the, the closing off of of, uh, of parts of the internet, the you know Google and Facebook being like, okay, we're just gonna you're, you're gonna see our news here. We're just gonna take that value from the people who are producing it. We're gonna take you know your community impact of advertisers, sort of akin to the, the developers here in New York outside um, Prospect Park. Uh, being able to, uh, uh, you know, charge millions more for every room in that uh, that uh, apartment building or condominium or whatever because it's overlooking a beautiful park, a beautiful park that you know belongs to everyone and is now slightly less beautiful because someone built uh, <laughs> a building in the middle. Um, also, that says awesome things. Um, so the, uh, we, our attention and our data is, is being increasingly uh, hoovered up by companies. Um, so these are, you know, I mean, you could argue that a lot of the evaluation is based on, on control of the data. Axiom, which is one you probably haven't heard of, is uh, they, they sort of like grab all of the, the data from when you swipe your credit card at the supermarket checkout. Um, and then they sell it back to the supermarket and everyone else. And there's a, like a private detective agency called IBI or like it's services private detectives that is is now like topping the list and no idea what their valuation is. But they're just like, oh we're just gonna grab data on absolutely everybody and sell it back to you know private investigators needed for versions going to go third on people. And then I keep saying like, hey, you know, advertisers like we know a lot of stuff. We know when someone you know hasn't gone out to eat for two weeks that 
you know, the type of food they like, and you know, it might be a good time to you know, nudge them to go out to eat again at your restaurant. Um, the, uh, oh, I think we get to Dries's point uh, coming up on this. Um, but I did want to mention that Which is not the Palantir that those Drupal sites just make it very clear, because they make it very clear. Um, this is like the military contractor, you know, spying company that creates another 450 million based on the idea that they will control even more of your data. Um, this is a sc uh, screenshot of, of Waze's website, and Waze has been purchased by Google for a huge amount of money, but you know, they still have an independent identity right now. They're unique and how honest they are about where their value comes from. Because it gets a little more hidden in, in Facebook and more like, well, it's all coming from the people with the content. Or Google, where it's like, well, how does it, you know, know the best route? Well, Waze is telling you directly, uh, nothing can beat real people working together. Millions of drivers out on the roads working towards a common goal to outsmart traffic and get everyone the best route for and that. It's like, that's awesome. And that whole like value and control is entirely captured by you know, Google who's in the models. But that was that's the model that we have. Like, you know, get venture funding, convince a lot of people it's a good idea, get bought out by some of the data. And that's the model that you know, most you know, technology companies have. Just to, the, the point of the find to make this, of course, made much better by the space of the economy. Um, but especially the alt text, which, you know, just makes the point how much information that these companies have on us and how little information we have about how they're using that information. It's, it's, it's the information asymmetry that's always the bigger problem than just a lot of data. And all right, so this is where another piece quote, um, and what he sees in a lot of it, let's see, is as value shifts from software to the ability to leverage data, companies will have to rethink their businesses just as Netflix and Google did. Now, this is blockbuster, which did not so successfully rethink their business model. Um, they, they shift. Um, and the shift is moving away from the, the value of the technology because you can say, okay, Waze is providing a really good user interface, giving away to add with this data, lots of smart algorithms and stuff. Facebook certainly pours lots of money into keeping their, um, their you know, <laughs> keeping you know billions of people connected at the same time. Like it's really an amazing technological feat. Uh, but regardless, the, the value is moving away from the technology to the data, to the network effects, to the connection. And as it becomes more evident to people um, that the, the technology may become start to become more commodity. So that may be a good thing for, for free software in general. Um, you know, because the, the value is much more the data, more even more of of the of the user interface layer. Um, the user experience layer um, may be able to be open source. But like I said, like that's, you know, in any line of business, that's going to need to take a lot of focus or a lot of things that can only be supported by, in what I'm arguing, supported by a business model of, you know, one person paying for, uh, you know, in some way directly paying for the service. So that the incentive is there to make it as good as possible. Wow. But the, uh, so the shift away from the software to data also has the potential to greatly advantage an alternate uh, business um, form, uh, like co cooperatives. So cooperatives are any organization where that organization is controlled by the people in it, um, with one person, one vote. So 
um, I'm in a worker cooperative, each person gets a vote. Yeah, that doesn't have a big effect on society. But when you start to look at these large platforms that control a lot of technology, a lot of um, network effects, um, the concept of having it in a cooperative ownership structure where the benefits and the control are much more distributed is uh, pretty large. And so the competitive edge for that kind of business structure um, may be the trustworthiness of the networks and the stewardship of the data. Um, one member, one vote of platform uh, of the platform may engender just greater trust because you you own it, so you know that you know collectively you are not going to sell the whole platform to someone who can make a little bit more money off of your data in the next quarter. You're, you, you're on the platform for the benefit it brings you. Uh, so, these folks in WebCamp offer a solution for control of data and all of that stuff, and it's called hosting your own website. Uh, and it's great, and they're working on ways to interconnect and improve the, uh, the user experience of the open web so that you can have more of a the, the walled garden, you know, communicating, sharing, following, keeping track of people experience on the open web. Um, but, you know, that's still like, they, they, there's not that business model I'm talking about there. This is talking about people just, you know, doing their own thing. So I'm suggesting marrying the idea of the free technology, the, the free software, open source free software, and the, um, with the business model of, of a cooperative, so a platform cooperative where the platform is owned by the people on it. And a major um, you know, potential uh, competitive advantage is that you know, only cooperative puts the customers, the people who need the service, in control of the platform and how any surplus generated by the platform is used. <laughs> and you know, as mentioned, um, software as a service, like licensed software, is too often used by a company to just keep extracting revenue without putting any value back in. I'm sure we've all paid for licensed software. Um, people use some of the things in the CAD family, especially paying for the same software every year um, without seeing much improvement in it. Um, and the atrophying of software platforms is inefficient for the economy at large. Competitors have to start from scratch and redo everything, including acquiring customers. Um, but it's also in inefficient for the specific customers um, who have to incur switching costs to get to a platform that has invested in significant improvement sometime recently. So if the switch is made to platform cooperatives, the continued investment in the reason people came to the uh, platform in the first place, um, whatever that platform might be, whether it's you know ride hailing or social networking, um, could um, could give it a sustained competitive advantage. And then there's the ownership effect of a platform cooperative, um, where the primary ben beneficiaries are owners and are more emotion emotionally invested in the platform and are more engaged in participatory planning, especially in beta testing, user research, and possibly you know, a source of extra investment, um, boosting monetary contributions when Call for to bring it to the next level, which can include um, before launch. Um, you know, people have funded Kickstarter campaigns where they don't get any ownership. They're just like, that's a cool thing I want. So the idea is to, you know, be able to have new, um, you know, technology companies, you know, classic startups, be able to say, all right, are we going to go around and beg um, some investors for millions to do our our product? Or, you know, can I do what a lot of them are doing anyway? Getting a bunch of people to sign up just because the idea is cool and they hardly have anything. And partly that, you know, they do that, get some money from people, and then they go and sell those people to an investor. But instead of doing that, to continue to sell their company to their customers. Which, uh, you know, again, has, has been done, uh, just not so much in the technology world where the potential and the potential for um, 
you know, democratic management of Pumpkin is much, much higher than like there in Austin, Texas is the Black Star um, Pub and Brewery, which is owned by the, you know, by community members who um, want to, to drink and eat and be married. And they, uh, you know, it serves other people too, but it's actually owned by people who bought in a little bit to, uh, to be able it's managed by workers um, democratically, but it's actually owned by the customers. So this is internetofownership.net, and I put some links on the pad from the beginning, and we'll show it at the end also. Um, and, you know, the presentation notes of, of all the slides. Um, and, and so internetofownership.net is the place that's trying to aggregate everyone who's trying to try out this idea of platform cooperatives, applying the idea of a member-owned um, business to internet businesses. And so just, uh, you know, some of the things that are considered elements of a uh, platform cooperative, you know, some kind of online marketplace um, with ubiquitous access, um, ability to capture attention, um, and again, just be everywhere, so the network effect is large. And then connecting different types of users, so producers and consumers often. But then, you know, being able to access uh, capital, startup money, money or you know, investment money um, from a wide base um, rather than, you know, a few people who are looking for a hundred x return, but a wider base of people who are mostly looking for the service itself. So, <laughs> um, I almost feel like you can't like give a talk at all anywhere without talking about global warming. Um, so, I uh, laid out dire things in the beginning. It's like, you know, can platform cooperatives and free software, you know, do anything to help save humanity with global warming as an overarching threat? And uh, the uh, really ridiculous claim is that they can help. Um, so staying with the example of sort of, you know, you know, what caused global warming, burning of fossil fuels. And so using the example of oil, gas, and coal companies, why do corporations do such evil things as destroy the planet for the profit of a few people? Um, I think a lot of the key is the word few. Um, the benefits of doing this are sharply, sharply, highly, highly concentrated. And in some ways made even worse by stripping of responsibility from the benefit. So like, yeah, there's some distributed shareholders, but they're being represented um, by people who, uh, you know, they, they, they don't get a vote in anything specific. They just have given the general, you know, message, increase my money, and everyone in the system is incentivized to do exactly that. Um, and so, you know, so the benefits are sharply concentrated and the costs are distributed among everyone. I and mean, whenever you have that situation, um, you have some sort of inevitable uh, fight on your hands where there's the, the people with the concentrated benefit are going to try uh, to keep it. So, by distributing um, benefit and responsibility for oversight more broadly, and by distributing uh, actual control with free software, um, you know, potential control and the actual control with the cooperative being democratically controlled, um, you know, and control of the network effects, control of where the value is really coming from, um, help decisions, you know, that helps decisions get made with the broader societal benefit in mind. So if our next set of powerful institutions are, you know, if our transportation company is not Uber, that you know controls everything, but uh, a cooperative, there's a much better chance that um, you know decisions will be made in the interest of a broader number. It's not 
100% answer, but it's one thing that can help a little bit. Um, and I have a lot of stuff I'd like to talk about as far as like doing this in Drupal specifically, but I'd like to open for questions first. I'll go right into it. Well, anything? Thoughts? Concerns? My mental health or otherwise? Uh, all right. So in uh, yeah. So I, I think I didn't do as good a job as presenting like the the microcosm of, of Drupal in this in this world. And it's coming from my perspective as doing you know web development for ten years when I started. Like you just said, you did websites, and someone hired you because they sort of wanted a website. And you know, it probably wasn't like like ethically responsible then to like set someone up with something running PHP or any other you know interpreted code in a database, like and throw it on the internet and expect that just to like you know not gonna happen at some point. But uh, but now it's like it's 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 clearly business malpractice to sort of do something as as. Uh, as an independent person, and maybe you put them on WordPress.com, you can you know, self post on WordPress, it does update itself. Um, but sort of that entryway into um, our industry, I think, is, is much harder now. You sort of have to start working for somebody else. And, and that is because we don't have this model of serving the smaller jobs, the smaller, um, you know, smaller clients, basically, directly. And you sort of have to, you can't treat smaller clients as well as clients, but you have to have a business model that supports them as customers. And um, I see the potential to do that again in AAA, um, which we haven't had for a bit because you know, Drupal as a, as a hosted service where you didn't have access to. Um, you know, we didn't have direct access to the code. Basically, it doesn't fly because, like, one of the most important things any um, you know business or organization needs is to customize it for their world. And if you don't have access to the PHP when you our themes were based on PHP template, that means you at most you use like CSS injector to get to your own world. So cloud-based um, solutions for Drupal, you know, seven, you know, weren't the best. Drupal 8, you have the possibility of doing a platform where a professional site builder or designer can do a site for someone, charge a reasonable amount, put them on the platform, um, and have full control of the configuration in a like actual professional version control way, have full control over the, the template and the design, um, and still leave them on a platform that can handle all of the security updates. So all the platform would be limiting is like what modules it supports, and that actually gives us, you know, gives all of the shops building on that platform a an incentive to be like, okay, we are going to make this contribute instead of custom, so that I don't have to support it on my own for forever. And we we've all known that like it's better to have it, you know, contrib. But there's a difference between like, okay, someone else will help with the security, you know, actual patches. And be like, oh, it's just going to be a, a platform, and it's going to take care of all of the security updates entirely. Um, and I think that kind of platform has the strongest, you know, potential. You know, being dedicated to not having a proprietary layer on top, and being dedicated to being cooperative with the members, and probably of, of the people who you know have sites on it. Um, and, and but probably with like the, the development shops that bring people onto the platform, you're having a proxy vote because you know the person who wants a website, they aren't going to have strong opinions of how, um, you know, of, of what the next direction for the platform should be. Uh, they might, but their service provider is going to have an even better idea of you know whether e-commerce should be added next, whether. Um, uh, Contact relationship management should be added next. Um, but the exciting thing is, you know, having taking the money for the 
hosting and the further development of the software together so that we can actually put all that effort into polishing the final piece of the UI. We can make the editor experience like perfect. Uh, we can actually do good CRM, uh, which I don't think has been done because everyone hates their CRM. Um, and maybe we won't succeed in making one that's great either, but um, the, the platform concept gives free software a chance to compete, and it gives a chance for um, for ownership to be more distributed uh, for things that can be really important to our businesses and our regular lives, our communication and uh, you know uh, e-commerce and just you know the nexus for our technology uh, platforms in general. Uh, you know, the, you mentioned, but like you know homes that are hooked up to you know services as you know big billboards like. You know, close the windows or control things in in uh, in your home from you know wherever, and that works both ways. And, and so, like, just the uh, a lot of things where trust is important, security is important, and ultimate control for the the people who it's for the benefit for the platform cooperative plus free software model um, is pretty strong, and I. Trying to encourage uh, shops think that way because it's for me it's just be really really exciting to start working for the benefit of a large number of people rather than having to only work for clients that can you know afford you know to hire a development shop um, design development shop um, for for their needs so and, uh, I feel universities are on the pathway there sort of doing it for a large number of clients, um, like internal, and bringing that to another level is when we finally get the investment back into the you know, Drupal core, Drupal 8 being able to add improvements to Drupal 8 itself, and to all the future modules that um, you know, support specific needs. That's, uh, that effort is continuing with um, uh, I mean, it, so so I've been sort of making this pitch to a group of people who are coming at it from uh, from very much from a, a similar perspective, um, who made uh, Drupal distribution. So installation profiles, package up everything, make it really um, you know, really easy for someone to get a site that has a specific purpose. Um, but here's where like the the funding model and and the technical practice. Are like so far away. Who benefits, you know, who needs an off-the-shelf uh, you know, installation profile, distribution, someone who does not have the money to pay for customizations? How is the development shop that made the distribution going to get money by people who need to pay for customizations? So most um, Drupal distributions, which you know have everyone for years have, has felt has really been in, that are going to be are going to be really important to Drupal's um, success and and uh, and being useful and, and more for more people in more markets. Um, it's based on distribution profile um, distributions, installation profiles, which we don't have a good economic model for. And if you just take that online as software as a service as a platform, which um, you know, Roomify.us is doing. Um, which a whole number, uh, a whole large number of, of distributions have tried a little bit, um, but really shifting towards the, that's our focus to provide a software as a service, the distribution is secondary, um, and uh, you know, treating it like you know, a, a startup business that's uh, trying to acquire customers for something, see if you can get enough people interested first, sign them up, um, use, uh, funding that they're putting in as owners to polish and uh, develop it for a specific purpose uh, is is where you know the the business model comes back around. So I've been advocating that to um, people who had been involved uh, with the open outreach distribution for those not for profits and grassroots groups and cause based organizations. Um, as Ned and Rosemary have talked about earlier. 
and some people involved in the open aid distribution also geared towards um, you know cause-based organizations, not for profits. Um, Clayton doing uh, aid, and that effort, like you know, there's a lot of ideas about making configuration management easier so that we can we can have um, you know. We can, we can have features that build on each other and uh, all of that, but that sort of broader effort is, called, is, is being called Drutopia, which is a very, very, very soft launch starting, but Drutopia.org uh, is where you can read the manifesto with a lot of, well, again, I'm the one pushing them in the platform cooperative direction, but where they're like, okay, we need to make Drupal um, good for small groups again. Um, which has powered a lot of people's innovation in the past, um, and and all that. So um, pushing that to to any of the platform cooperative direction. So if I'm going to be doing stuff this stuff, I'll probably be there. So everyone is sort of free to pick a sector that actually has money to spend on the on the Drupal as a service. Um, but you know, it, it's it's a kind of ecosystem where we could you know work together. Um, and, you know, lots of these shared functionality, um, and yeah, that's the idea that there's lots of play, lots of businesses that can afford, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in startup costs, maybe fifty dollars a month um, in uh, in hosting, you know, hosting, but where you know a good third or half of that is going directly back into further software development for their needs and people as a whole and you know that's how we get out of this this issue of it's only people being funded by very large entities that have one set of needs um, or hobbyists and actually have that last mile of excellent um, user experience being put into um, into the uh, into the you know into the sites into the 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 services that smaller organizations and individuals need. Yeah. Are you familiar with AGR and Open Desktop yep. in New York? Yeah. How, how is your relationship with them? Um, we might we we're in talks with um and and AGR focused um uh, cooperative actually work on cooperative in, in Canada um that um, praxis that is, you know, th that would be interested in hosting this. So, yeah, so I, I, I think I'm really hoping that, like, also that one little final twist on this model is that there's the cooperative that is funding the development. It needs to be getting money from the hosting, but it doesn't need to be doing the hosting itself. So it just needs hosting partners who are willing to pass on, like, the membership share to the development um, group. And so, you know, potentially any host could be part of it. Um, and, you know, Agar and, and multi-site is definitely a, a, a possible approach to hosting the platform. And, um, but so I'm, I'm staying pretty technology agnostic on, on the hosting side at this point and, and hoping that, like, yeah, it, it can stay that way um, because, you know, Drupal supports all different kinds of of hosting models, and you know something built in the Drupal ecosystem should also. <laughs>